we have to integrate our Islamic past as European, as something that has formed our culture. Without Islam, our literature, the Divina Commedia, would never have existed. This is Muslim Footprints, an opportunity to deep dive into Muslim civilizations through the ages, accompanied by some of the best experts and academics in their field. My name is Aisha Dyer. Muslims govern Sicily from 827 to 1061. A thousand years later, the influence of Muslim civilization remains. You can find it in the language, like atzitzari, which means to embellish, from the Arabic word aziz, meaning precious or beautiful, and in local place names like marsala, which is said to derive from Marsa Ali, Port of Ali, or Marsa Ala, Big Harbour, or even Marsa Allah, God's Harbour. Michele Amari, a great historian of Islamic Sicily from the 19th century, ends his monumental work with a chapter on cakes and sweets, saying that's where you can find Muslim heritage today in things like Casata Siciliana and cannoli. If you visit Sicily, you can still see Muslim influence in its built environment. Churches with domes and Arabic inscriptions, irrigation systems that are still in operation, and of course, Palermo itself that recalls the urban design of North Africa's historic cities. To this day, fishermen in Sicily can be heard singing the words Aya Mola, Aya Mola. It translates to Oh My Lord in Arabic. It was a way to ask God's help when catching fish during the Matanza, a traditional tuna fishing technique introduced to the island while it was under Muslim rule. In this episode, we hear from Bill Granara, research professor of Arabic at Harvard University who talks about his book on the Sicilian poet Ibn Hamdis, among the island's most famous Muslims. And then for broader context, we have Nicola Carpentieri, who you heard at the beginning of this episode. Nicola is professor of Arabic at the University of Padua in Italy. And he's just won a 2 million euro grant to research Muslim Sicily. He suggests that the influence of Islam may extend beyond Sicilian delicacies or fishing to culture as we understand it today. Not just Sicilian culture, but European culture at large. We start with Nicola Carpentieri, who tells us how Muslim civilization arrived in Sicily. It all began with a Byzantine general who attempted a coup on the island and then sought assistance from the Aglabids, the Arab Muslim dynasty that was ruling North Africa at the time. Well, there is the anecdote behind the coming of the Muslims, which it has to do with treason. And because of this crime or some other crime, this uh, person was recalled to Byzantium to be to, to, to face trial and instead went over to Tunisia, uh, Ifriqiya, uh, and basically promised Sicily to the Aglabids, the ruling 
emirs of, of what is today Tunisia. And, uh, and there was this fierce debate at the Aglabid court, whether, oh, are we going to go? We're going to not go. Uh, we have a peace treaty with the Byzantines. We can't really attack them. But the fact is, Sicily was a big prize. It was a very wealthy uh, province. It was strategically placed at the center of the Mediterranean. So that's really, I think, where you want to look for the, the, the reasons behind the Muslim invasion, so to speak, of Sicily. Since time immemorial, everyone, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Romans, they were all interested in Sicily. Paint us a picture of what Sicily was like, this island between the Islamic Empire and Byzantium. We have to understand first and foremost that Muslim Sicily throughout its existence is what in Arabic we call a thagr. It was a frontier state. This is where people go to fight Christians, the Greeks. So it is a frontier state and it's a bit of a wild west for Islam. We have travelers going to Sicily, you know, like Ibn Hawqal, and being entirely appalled by what they see there. People speak crooked Arabic. They have the khutbah in the, in the Friday mosque and, they, and their Arabic is all crooked. And Ibn Hawqal turns to the next guy in the row and says, what, what is this imam talking about? He doesn't even speak Arabic. And the, and the Sicilian tells him, oh, look, we do things differently here. You know, this is Sicily. You know, we, we do things, you know, however we want. Then he goes off in the countryside and... Muslim women are marrying Christian men and they're raising their children, both Christian and Muslims. The, the, the daughters are Muslim and the, the boys are Christian, something like that. And even Haukal is entirely appalled. It's like, what is this land? And the heroes are really not there. The heroes have all become school teachers because the school teachers don't have to go and fight. So if you want to talk about a Sicilian Islamic civilization, we have to understand that we are really here at a kind of the periphery, a kind of lawless land, but also a land where you can make incredible profits. Historians have this narrative that Byzantine Sicily had become some kind of backwater. So it was in a state of immobility. And this is often contrasted with the Muslim period that instead saw a kind of revival. And Sicily, in every single narrative that we have from travelers, amazes the travelers because of its wealth. It's rich. Palermo has got more mosques than Cordoba, apparently. And this is, of course, commerce, slave trade, but also uh, um, those, uh, you know, crops that Europe wanted access to and were not present in Europe. Silk production and embroidery was present in Sicily. And we are very close to the heartland of Europe here. So, you know, there's a lot of money to be made, paper, uh, uh, so on and so forth. We can think of Muslim Sicily in three periods. There's the invasion in 827 by the Aglabids from Ifriqiya and a period of consolidation of power. Then you have the Fatimids who topple the Aglabids in North Africa and Sicily becomes part of their empire from 909 onwards. And that's where Muslim Sicily comes into its own. So we have the Aglabid period, and you want to think of this roughly less than a century where Sicily consolidates as a kind of Muslim land. But then in 909, the Fatimid revolution in North Africa turns the tables. The Fatimids storm North Africa, and Ifriqiya becomes this kind of Ismaili Shiite Khilafah or a caliphate, if you want. And Sicily becomes part of this. 
In this Fatimid period that begins in 909, you have the apogee of Muslim Sicily, when finally Sicily attains what it has been aspiring throughout its history, and that is a degree of autonomy. They get a kind of viceroy, the Kalbids, the Kalbid dynasty, that are viceroys really for the Fatimids. The deputies from the Fatimids, they become a kind of de facto independent little dynasty in Palermo. They have their court. They have their court poets. They have their bureaucrats. They have the kutab. Um, you know, uh, they, they control the economy, the commerce. This is the moment where Sicily becomes a cultural entity in Islam. So if you picture a map of Sicily, I would say that during its apogee, all of the island is under Muslim rule, but the cities, the, the eastern more cities, really quite remain strongly Hellenicized Greek. And finally, you have Muslim Sicily's disintegration in the 11th century, the fitna or civil war, as it starts to fracture from internal strife and dynastic disputes. And this is when the Normans come in. They're aided by the fitna. They step into a land that is in entire disarray. There's a very charismatic Kalbid emir. It's called Yusuf al-Kalbi. And he has a stroke. And he becomes half paralyzed. And so he kind of withdraws from power. And his sons start killing each other. From this moment on, things go downhill very rapidly. The island is split among local warlords and you have a period of what they call the taifas, just like in Spain, from the word taifa in Arabic, which means faction, and you have little principalities. And they're all squabbling, they're all fighting each other. So you have a little taifa in Palermo, you have a taifa in Mazzara, you have a taifa in Messina. And in one of the squabbles, the Ibn Thumna is very close to, to Calabria, and he turns to Calabria just across the strait and he sees the Normans and these are powerful warriors, Vikings from the north, you know, very, very, they're not Vikings, of course, they come from Normandy, but they're descendants of Vikings. And he's like, wait a minute, these guys will help me. So he crosses the strait and has a ward with Robert Piscard, this Norman warlord. And he's like, oh, well, if you come and help me in Sicily, I'll give you the island. Anyway, the Normans come in, the island is in disarray, they're all bickering, they're all fighting each other. There's no, no, nobody to face the Normans, really. They go from town to town, they conquer citadel after citadel, and they're a band of adventurers, these Normans. They have nowhere to go, and, and they conquer the island. Ibn Athumna is killed in an ambush, and they're like, well, what are we going to do now? Well, let's, let's just carry on. And, and they get to Palermo. And of course, the big cities put up a resistance, but eventually they take over. It's around this time that Ibn Hamdis is born. When we talk about Muslim civilizations in Sicily or in any place, we also look to who its most famous people were. Bill Granara, can you tell us about one of the best-known Muslim Sicilians, Ibn Hamdis? I would say that in Western scholarship, Adrisi, the geographer who wrote a book on uh, Roger II, is probably better known than Ibn Hamdis. But in the Arab world, to Arabic readers, uh, Ibn Hamdi is the most important the reason being is that he left us a diwan of poetry. He lived a long life during which he documented people, events, names, and places in which he lived. So we have a strong autobiographical voice emanating from the many verses that he's left, something like 5,000 verses through 360 poems. He was born in the island of Sicily in the year 1055 at a time when Muslim civilization was in full bloom, but also at a time when the island was starting to fracture 
among uh, different princes, local princes. So it's the existence of his poetry that makes him known. And it's from his poetry that we can glean tidbits about his early life and the kind of social environment he was growing up in. We can only make assumptions based on some of the snippets of information. Uh, he was born in the province of Noto, around the city of Syracuse. We assume that because he was a fifth or sixth generation Muslim whose great-great-grandfathers conquered Sicily, he came from the landed gentry. His father and his grandfather were not politically involved, but we know that they did exist when he was a boy. We do know that he lived a life of luxury. His mother died and he and his sister went to live with his paternal aunt who also lost her husband and had two children, and it was in the house of the grandfather. His father was still alive, but his father remarried. So we do know that the members of his family were still alive when he was a young boy. We start to get his autobiographical verse in his early 20s when he was beginning to think about a career as a court poet. So he was born at this very tumultuous time. The last Muslim dynasty of Sicily, the Kalbids, had disintegrated in around 1040. And Sicily is in the hands of these petty kings. And the Norman armies are about to invade. There were internal divisions that were, you know, wreaking havoc on Islamic society as a whole on the island. There were, for instance, tensions between Uh, the rural and the urban. There were tensions between Arabs and Berbers. There were tensions between multi-generational Sicilians and newcomers from North Africa who kept migrating into the island. And there was also a Sunni Shiite divide that was not terribly pronounced. There were these divides on the ground, but Ibn Hamdis was very careful to stay away from that divide. He was what we would call today a pan-Muslim and he tried to unite all Muslims. He never addressed the question of any Sunni-Shiite divide, nor, for that matter, Arab-Berber divides. Also, there was the question in broader Europe, there was the question of the Christian reconquest that was going on in Spain and Sicily. So these were, these were two areas in which the island was experiencing some form or a good deal of disruption. So Ibn Hamdis decides to leave. He wants to be a paid court poet, and there were no courts left in Sicily. He takes his family and he settles in the city of Sfax, which is on the coast of Tunis, where apparently there were still family connections. He didn't stay long. He settled his family, and then he set out on the road. He went west on the littoral of uh, the North African coast, and he crossed over into what we now know as the Iberian Peninsula, and he was seeking to become a court poet at the uh, court of Al Mu'tamid, uh, Muhammad ibn Al Mu'tamid ibn Abad, who was the Prince of Seville and um, presided over a, a very strong politically and culturally eminent court in the in Seville. It's sort of like if you want to be an actor, you're going to go to Hollywood. You go to New York or you go to Hollywood. You want to go to the places where there's, there's much activity and, and fame was to be had. And, and Al-Andalus was the place to do it. So he comes to work for Mu'tamid bin Abed. Mu'tamid isn't just anybody. Besides being the last Muslim ruler of Seville, he's one of the most celebrated Andalusian poets. And we also have an extant diwan of his poetry as well. There were also other poets at his court, uh, Ibn Labana being one of them, for instance, as there were other Sicilian Muslims as well who went to his court. So uh, uh, Andalus, Spain, even though it was fractured, even though the Umayyad Caliphate had dissipated, uh, the petty kings, the petty princes of Andalus imitated the great court of Cordoba. So court life. I'm talking about the royal courts. These were the places that um, um, patronized poetry. Poetry was very important as a means to uh, buttress um, legitimacy and, and, and radiance, if you'd like, of a court. 
and there was just so much more that was going on in Alandalus. There was a lot of competition uh, among the petty kingdoms of who had the best uh, poets, and Ibn Hamdis went right into that direction. There's this great anecdote in the book about how Ibn Hamdis got hired. He and Muhtamid basically spar as poets. He was waiting for an audience and one can assume that he was a number of many people that were knocking on al Muhtamid's door to be a court poet, to be brought into the entourage, if you like, of the inner court and court culture. And he was receiving no response. And according to an anecdote and, and pieces of poetry, he despaired of waiting. He felt that he wasn't going to get an, or an audience, as we say, with al Muhtamid. So he decided to leave. And the night before he was leaving, as he was packing his bags, he saw a flashing lantern in the distance and a man showed up. And he said that al Muhtamid has granted him an audience. So he went. And when he arrived, uh, he went up to the residence of the prince and um, the prince made him sit down and they looked outside a window and saw a woman fanning the flames of a, of a furnace, a glass furnace. And Muhtamid, as he was a very eminent poet himself, started to recite the first hemistitch of a line of poetry and he expected Ibn uh, Hamdis to respond to the second hemistitch using the same meters. And he did three or four lines of the poem, and uh, he was sufficiently convinced that Ibn Hamdis had the talent uh, and the skill to join his court, where he stayed for 13 years. He wasn't the only one, but according to what we know from his Diwan, he wrote at least a dozen uh, panegyrics, poems of praise to al Muhtamid, and other things as well. So he was quite active in the court. We also know 13 years later, when the Berber, the, the Morabitin invaded Seville and brought al Muhtamid to a prison town south of Marrakesh, uh, Ibn Hamdis went to see him and they exchanged sorrowful goodbyes in verse, one writing a poem and the other a poem. And then eventually he left and he made his way east back again to the shores of Ifriqiya, what is now Tunisia, Sfax. And at this point, it was the Zerid princes, a dynastic rule of men who served the Fatimids and were given some autonomy once the Fatimids moved to Cairo in 972. So he comes into the later years of the, of the Zerids and he becomes a court poet to them as well. It seems like everybody was composing poetry at the time. Scholars, merchants, princes. So there was court poetry in which poets wrote panegyrics for kings and powerful people. And this was the most lucrative form of poetry. But poetry had also become an exercise, if you'd like, for people who wanted to join the bureaucracy. And the best way to prove your abilities in Arabic language was to imitate the great poets and how to use metaphor and simile and pieces of speech. So poetry had become in some ways uh, a part of not only the cultivation of the education of a, of, a, of a professional, but it also became a sport in some ways. One of the uses of poetry was done at uh, you know nocturnal bonding where men would get together after a hunt and they would go into these lodges and poets were often brought there as well. And some princes and uh, elite people and also intellectuals would try their hand at poetry just to show off their abilities in Arabic. But Ibn Hamdis was quite different. Ibn Hamdis didn't dabble in poetry. Poetry was his bread and butter. It was his way of life. It was his means of living. And so therefore his poetry has a seriousness, if you'd like, that survived in Arabic literary history that the others have not. He was solidly committed to poetry as a craft. Uh, he was conservative as a poet. He didn't deal with the muwashahat and the zajal. He stuck very closely to the classical Arabic qasida. So he's gone from Sicily to Spain, and now he's in North Africa. 
where he will spend the rest of his life. What do we see in his poetry now? In the last 40 years of his life, his poetry became more focused on his campaign to win back Sicily. So we see more of a kind of a rallying up Arabs and Muslims to go fight off the Normans of Sicily and go fight off the Christians of Spain. Because all of his movement, his leaving Sicily was in part in response to the Christian reconquest in Europe, and then in Spain as well, was fragmentation among the Muslims and the, the slow but successful acquisition of land by the Catalans and the different groups in Spain. So his Poetic mission became more and more politicized. We know nothing about whether he prayed five times a day. There's no record of him going to the Hejaz to make the Hajj. We don't know anything of his religious life, but he did use jihad as a political weapon to rally Muslims, all Muslims, to fight the Christians and to gain back his homeland of Sicily. He had to write panegyrics. If he was going to make a living, if he was going to be paid by the court, he had to sing the praises of the prince. But he never lost an opportunity to kind of pull in, you are the defender of the faith, and you're the one who's going to bring Sicily back into Dar al Islam. Given that Ibn Hamdis only knew Sicily as it was being invaded, what do you think it was about the island that he recalled or missed? It was his homeland pure and simple. I mean, occasionally he would talk about the idea of going hunting with his friends and then knocking on the doors of convents and um, they would buy wine and they would sing and dance and carouse. And by the way, in medieval Spain and in medieval Sicily, nuns, sorelle, are often euphemistic for women of nightly entertainment. So it's hard to get a sense of it. And the reality and the poetics kind of blur and mix in. So we see this in some of his verses, but it's, it's not a lot. But he was unequivocal in his quest to bring Sicily, the land of his youth, the land of these wonderful memories, the land where his ancestors' bones are buried. All of that he wants to bring back to, to Dar al Islam. And he uses the word Watan, which is the modern word for a nation. And my translation for Watan is one's rightful place in the world. And to him, his rightful place in the world is Sicily. He never forgot it, all during his long, long years in exile. The rest of the episode continues in just a moment after this message. On behalf of the team at The Ismaili, we'd like to thank you for tuning in to Muslim Footprints. We very much hope you're enjoying this show and would be grateful if you could leave us a review on your favourite podcast platform and subscribe so you don't miss our next episode. We appreciate your support and look forward to bringing you more valuable content in the future. Now, back to the show. Now let's go back to Nicola. It's the 1100s. Ibn Hamdis is in his final years and Sicily is in the hands of the Normans. And now you have about, you know, a couple of hundred Normans ruling over an island of thousands and they all speak Arabic and they're all Muslim. So what do you do? And the Normans were very practical people. And you can see this when you go to Palermo, how they handpicked their workmanship for their churches, for their pleasure palaces, for their castles. They got the best. You know, well, they had the Mott and Bailey technology for defensive purposes, but that was not going to cut it for a royal palace or for a church. So where do you get the workmanship? Well, we get the mosaics from Byzantium and we get the woodcraft and the carvery from the Arabs and our uh, ivory caskets where we keep our jewelry and our perfumes that we import from North Africa, from, from, from the Muslims. And if the population and the courtiers want to speak Arabic and practice Islam, it's fine. Who cares? And this is the beauty of Sicily. In a way, it's so central 
And on the other hand, it is so remote that incredible, unimaginable things can happen, like Christian kings having their praises sung in Arabic by Muslim poets and loving it. The Normans building their pleasure palaces, their munias in Islamic styles and, and living like sultans. There's a very famous historian called them the baptized sultans of Sicily. Muslim traditions continued under the Normans, including the tradition of poetry, of the Qasida. It was an Islamic way of, of making the court and making culture. And this is what's important for us. There is something which is called the Majlis al-Uns, the gathering of boon companions, the friendly gathering of the court. The Muslim ruler, after his day of chores and, and political commitments in the evening, has a time to relax with his court and courtiers. In this Majlis al-Uns, poets read their poems, there's musicians, there's dance. This is not just the locus of entertainment. It's a locus of cultural production. Poetry is not only uh, performed, but also critiqued in a way. And the Normans embrace this wholeheartedly. And you can see it precisely in these pleasure palaces that dot the countryside around Palermo. This is where their court bureaucrats, their kutab, show up before the Norman king and, and read their beautiful poems to them in Arabic. And these beautiful poems are really descriptions of the locus amenus, the pleasant place that the court is, all its natural beauties. And all this language is borrowed from the Qasida, from the Arabic poem. And this is a turning point for European and Western literature in my reading. This cultural practice is handed down from the Normans to then the Swabians, to Frederick II, who, for his imperial aspirations, in a way, fosters the formation of a bureaucratic caste that's very adept in poetry, just like the Normans were doing with the Muslims, and then encourages them to write in Italian. The court bureaucrat, the Katib, becomes the notaro at the court of Frederick II. And the notari are the people that create Italian literature. These notari in Sicily, without them, we wouldn't have Dante, we wouldn't have Petrarch, we wouldn't have all the great humanists that develop European culture. Without the Sicilian poets, the Sicilian court bureaucrats that began writing in Italian, we would not have Western literature as such. Their poetics not only initiate Italian literature, but they also influence European humanists all the way to, you know, England, France, you know, Ronsard, all these people. They're influenced by them. They, 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 they would not have existed without the Sicilian school. And this is where Nicolas' thesis comes in. His Sicilia project which is Sicily in Arabic, aims to reimagine the literary history of Europe. According to the classic thesis, the poets of the Sicilian school were inspired by French medieval poetry. But Arabic poetry had flourished for centuries in Sicily. There were other important poetic traditions too in Sicily, including Hebrew, Greek and Latin. And this is what we're missing now. Somebody telling us how Arabic poetics have molded the poetics of the Scuola Siciliana. So this is it. With the Calbids in the 10th century, we have the formation of a court with core poets that are mostly not professional poets. They're all kutab, they're all bureaucrats, and they write poems, mainly love poems. So words like hob, hawa, gharam, that's something that caught my eye, because then if you look at the Sicilian school, these Italian poems, they're all about love. 
We have Arabic poetry under the Muslims. Then we have Arabic poetry under the Normans. And then we have Friedrich II and we have, you know, Italian poetry. They're all talking about love. It's just the change in language. We are used to think along the, the boundaries of national literatures. And that does not work in Sicily because people spoke many languages in Sicily. The court spoke four languages. On the street, people spoke Hebrew, they spoke Genoese, they spoke, you know, Sicilian, Arabic, Greek. How can you think along national boundaries? It's impossible. Sicily defies the idea of nation in the traditional sense. To reinforce this idea that Muslim poetry influenced European literary traditions, Nicola is looking at the practice of poetry creation. Poetry writing was not only meritocratic, it also established a code of behaviour to rise above differences and unite people at an intellectual level. That's the level of the heart. My way of looking at this is that you want to look at the social practice of writing poetry. Poetry is not a pastime or something to kind of, you know, entertain yourself and your audience during the Middle Ages and before. Poetry has a performative power. It does things as when you make an oath. I make an oath to you. If we have to get married, the words I say, they are affecting reality. They're changing reality. So that's what Arabic poets were doing since the pre-Islamic times with their poems. They were shaping the world. This is something that goes back to ancestral time. If you think of the kind of the tie between poems and, and incantations in pre-Islamic time. An incantation is something that affects reality, right? And the same was true for, for poetry. Poetry shapes the social space. And in Sicily, poetry shaped the court. It gave to the court a code of behavior that affected interactions. Basically, what the poets were saying is like, we're all sophisticated, we're all lovers here. And this is, there's a beautiful study by Drori and Al Ghazi that says this that at the Islamic court, everyone from the caliph to the last of the courtiers must be a lover. And what does it mean to be a lover? It means that you're the way you behave, the way you talk, the way you move, everything. You embody this code and you become a kind of sophisticated agent. To make it, and then the Normans thought, this is my reading of it. This works. It doesn't matter whether you're a Berber or a Muslim or an Arab or a Greek, or I'm a Norman and I'm fair and you're dark and I have blue eyes. At the court, we can come together as a kind of sophisticated agents, as lovers in a way. And, and we can create a neutral space of interaction based on artistic competence. And this worked. It created a social space that worked, that was capable of bridging differences. And who were the agents that shaped this, this social space? The poets. There's a beautiful line by a Sicilian uh, emir that writes to a courtier. And he's trying to, he's trying to attract this courtier to his court and say, come to us, come to us. Even if our ancestry divides us, our nasab, in a way, divides us. We are united by adab. We are united by this code of behavior. The adab is the code of behavior of the court. But it's also literature. And adab is deeply intertwined with poetry as well. So what the, what the emir is saying is like, it doesn't matter whether you're a Berber or wherever you're coming from, come to us because through Adab we are united. And this echoes a line by Abu Tamam that says the same. Though our Nasab divides us, though our, our ancestry divides us, we are united by Adab. So Adab shapes bonds at court. And that is precisely what happens under Frederick II later. It's just the change of language. For us, it's such a big thing. I don't think it was such an important thing at the time. Muslim Footprints is developed and produced by Kelima Communications 
in partnership with The Ismaili. Thank you to Teresa and Maggio for the Ayamola recording. Our theme tune is Mola Mama Jan, performed by Black Heat. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and tap the follow or subscribe button. It's free. I'm Aisha Dyer, and you've been listening to Muslim Footprints. <laughs>